creation, not evolution. The emphasis is very much on the word creation. Um, I will mention evolution in passing, but not to any great extent. And I hope to demonstrate tonight, by just looking at one creature, how there is a creator. That, in fact, all life forms around us have been wonderfully designed. But we just read Genesis chapter 1, and we as Christadelphians believe wholeheartedly in that record. And uh, what a majestic chapter it is. And it starts off uh, in a grand way, doesn't it? And straightway, modern man at any rate, is challenged because right in the beginning of that very first sentence, we read, In the beginning God created. And then Genesis chapter 1 tells us something of how we did it. It's not a great scientific a uh, tree ties, such as some would desire, but nevertheless, God explains so that all men have access to it. An explanation, some understanding for all men and women as to how he created. So in the beginning, God created. There we are, straight from the beginning. Uh, we have a challenge set before us, which we, as I say, Christadelphians believe wholeheartedly. And as you read on from Genesis 1 and through the Bible, you become more and more convinced just want to take you down to verses 20 and 21, which we read um, concerning the fifth day where we have life coming into being. Where we see the fish created and the birds of the air. And I've brought you to these two verses because we're going to focus in on that which um, a creature that lives very much in the waters. Every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. We're told that that's God at work there and creating all life forms in the seas and in the waters. And we're going to look at one creature now. What are these gentlemen eating? Um, I don't think jelly eels are so popular now as, as they used to be. But uh, at one time, eels were eaten a lot in this country. And in certain parts of the world, it's still quite a, a, a common food. In fact, if, if you go to Holland you'll know that the Dutch eat quite a, quite a bit of uh, eels if they can get them, more of that in due course. But if you were going to struggle as to what they were eating, I was just going to show you this and just um, ask you if you knew what the otter was eating. You know, the third one, clearly it's an eel, and it's a heron. So we're going to talk about the eel um, for about the next 30 minutes. It's not I'm a scientist. And I've done some extensive research on the eel. Not at all. I'm just a, a common man. And all the information I'm going to present to you, I've just found uh, in the internet and, and uh, a book or two. Well, that which I've found, um, I obviously think is impressive enough to share with you the eel, as I say. And uh, I want to bring you to this character, Johannes Schmid, who was uh, a Dane... And in the 1920s, spent a fair bit of time researching the eel. And uh, interesting English we've got here. He wrote a journal to the Royal Society. And uh, as I say, interesting English, sort of old-fashioned English. So I don't know quite how he picked that up. But nevertheless, I hope we can get the gist of this passage. He talks about the eel question. We know then that the old eels vanish from our ken into the sea and that the sea sends us in return innumerable hosts of elvers. So I'll just show you what he's referring to. So uh, there's an old eel. And in that first paragraph he's saying, we know they go from the rivers, they go out to the sea, and they, they, they disappear from us. And then later on, some months later, we get back, Elvers, which are very young eels, obviously. But whether, to continue his quote, but whether have these eels, have they, they wandered these old eels, and whence have the elvers come? And what are the still younger stages like, which precede the elver stage in the development of the eel? It is such problems that constitute the eel question. So there's this mystery, and it's, it's there right through to the 1920s, uh, of the life cycle of the eel. 
We know of big eels that go from the river back into the seas. We know these small versions of an eel that come the other way. But where did they originate from? And what happens in the meantime between the eels that go out and the small ones that come in? So this was the eel question. And I'll tell you that even in 2016, there is some what of a mystery um, still to be solved. There's still things to be sorted out on this situation. And of course, it's only mysterious to man. God who created them knows exactly their life cycle and knows everything all the way around. And... Um, he was a little bit unfair, really, was uh, our Danish scientist, because in 1886, a Frenchman did a little bit of work on the eel. He found these, I believe it was in the Mediterranean, he, he caught some Leptocaphilus brevirostrius. So I made a real mess of it. I, I rather like what's in brackets, flathead. <laughs> that, that will do for now. He caught some flathead, and um, everyone up to that point, up to 1886, and a little bit later, I'll, I'll show you that in a moment, all thought they were fish. All thought they were fish. Well, he, he got these so-called fish, took them home uh, to his laboratory, and um, from these small two-inch, five-centimetre creatures that were supposed to be fish, he actually found himself... Um, feeding up and having eels before him. And it just pours in there. It just, it just shows you, it's a little demonstration of how ignorant man can be for so long. You know, men, in, even in the 1880s, thought they were pretty sharp and knew quite a bit. Well, these fish were not fish at all. They're eels. Poor chap. It took him to 1893 before people actually recognised his work. They gave him a bit of a hard time. But by 1893, it was accepted, indeed, that the flatheads were actually um, very small eels. The reason why they're called flathead is you can perhaps anticipate, you know, it's a very flat, leaf-like shape. In fact, I've got that uh, in that paragraph. A leaf-like two-inch creature. Well, going back to our friend, uh, Mr. Schmid, in the 1920s, as I say, he started to look into this further, and uh, he went out into the Atlantic, must have been out there weeks on end researching, and he found out that the, the further he went out to sea, the smaller these flatheads seemed to be. So he may well have found some that were about two inches, then it went down to one inch, and smaller and smaller they went. And in 1922, he went as far as the Sargasso Sea, which is south of Bermuda. There's a map for you. And I understand the Sargasso Sea is the only sea in the world without a coastline, uh, which is kind of strange in itself, but there we are. He went as far as there. And then he could find no, no, uh, no, no uh, young eels, as it were, any smaller. So he found something out that nobody else was aware of before. And um, he identified that the Sargasso Sea was the area where the spawning grounds must be for these fish. That's what an eel is. It's a type of fish. Um, despite what I said earlier, it, it, it's a fish creature, but it's not fish in the, in the normal sense, as I'm sure you'll understand. But anyway, Sargasso Sea being the place of their origin. Now just to make life a little bit more interesting, as well as the European eel that we're talking about now, there is something called the American eel. And they also come from the Sargasso Sea. But they go up to the uh, North American coastline, up to Canada and so on. But I'm not going to talk about those, and there are some differences between the two. But the Sargasso Sea from there um, seems to be the birthplace for these young eels. And in his research, but in my paragraph above, um, by the time these actually get to our shores, get over to Europe, 
Uh, thanks for the Gulf Stream, bringing them on their way, and it may take a year, might take up to three years. Again, there's a bit of a mystery on that, but a debate on that, even now, saying 2016, how long does it actually take? Common view at the moment is it might take up to three years. By the time they get there, three and a half inches long. Something of that order, or nine centimetres for you. The younger ones amongst us. And we get these wonderful creatures. As I say, this very early stage in terms of them being in British waters and so on, they're known as glass eels, but they don't stay as glass eels for very long. And as they go into the estuaries and then into fresh water rivers and so on, they change colour. And before I go any further, just stop and wonder for a minute. We have a fish that's come to the berth in salt water. And it's now, having travelled over 3,000 miles, going into fresh water and doing very well at it. The change between living in a salt water environment and a fresh water environment uh, is remarkable. Um, just staggering that change, how that happens. And I do not believe that's happened by chance. And uh, in the life cycle of the eel, um, you know, we go back to the days of Genesis and so on, when they were first created, it has to work straight away or it never works at all. You know, that fish has got to change from living in a saltwater environment to a freshwater environment, and then the cycle goes on. Otherwise, it breaks down and it comes to a, a terrible end. Um, if you're not impressed with that one, surely that impresses you, does it? And uh, there it is. And, it, and it, it's no longer flat. It's more cylindrical now. It's changed shape. So its constitution has changed, so it can now live in fresh water. It's changed shape. And um, there they go. And the amazing thing about glass eels, um, they are so determined to go upstream, so determined to go up river. They don't, some of them do, but not, not many of them stay in the estuaries. They go, they go in, up those rivers and go inland. And they go over all sorts of uh, natural challenges. And they do if it's a good year, and in great abundance, and they'll go over each other in their desperation, as it were, in that drive to go up river. They'll go over each other and so on. And um, they can pro propel themselves, as I've written there, over wet grass, dig through wet sand. It's just a force that's uh, unstoppable. They just keep on going and going. In 2014, which was a better year for eels, I, I was going to comment about them today um, earlier. Eels generally have diminished in Britain uh, dramatically. No, we have nowhere near the, among, um, the number of eels that we used to days of old. And uh, if 12, 12 and 14 year olds are out fishing like I did in those far off days, they would, be, they would do very well to catch an eel. They really would. Uh, eels are not... Not as numerous as they were, sadly, for all sorts of reasons, which I'm not going to go into tonight. But 2014, in relative terms, in recent years, it was a good year. And you've read it by now. Estimated 2 million elvers. Glass eels turn into elvers as they change colour. And they're a little bit bigger. 2 million elvers were helped on their way because their natural barriers are one thing. But when there's man-made barriers as well, that's difficult. So enabling them to move on and so that we don't lose eels altogether you've got these volunteers down there on the river Parrot that uh, did that incredible work and um, growth from there on um, is quite dramatic over the years in northern waters they grow more slowly than they do in southern regions so eels that come in and go into the Mediterranean and, and into southern France and so on. They grow at a different rate to those that may be up uh, in Scotland and so on. But nevertheless, some of them grow quite big. Um, an eel of five foot, the females tend to be bigger. I think in, in uh, 
times when eels are more commonly caught in Britain, if you've got one of about three foot, that a male lives about six or seven years, a female for about 10 or 12. However, um, for some strange reason, there are some pools here and there where they have eels that are there for 25, 30 or even 40 years. There's been an eel recorded, absolutely for sure, was 85 years. And one couple of years ago, in the bottom of a Swedish well, reckoned to be 155 years old. It seems that uh, their lifespan, uh, their duration of their life, varies somewhat. In large densities, such as those traditionally found in the rivers Severn, the Wye, Parrot, which all drain into the Bristol Channel, the majority of glass eels or elvers remain male. But where densities are low, not so many of them, such as the rivers on the east coast of England, like the Suffolk Stour, many change from male to female to improve the odds of successful spawning. Now, I don't think this is anything that the creature decides upon. It's not as if the creature decides this or that. It's the conditions that the creatures find themselves in and overall how they've been designed that this comes about. This is of, this is of God. This is not of chance. But how amazing it is that many change from male to female. Just pause there for a moment. There's a lovely prayer in Nehemiah. Faithful men coming together. And they say, Thou, even thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven the heaven of heavens with all the host, the earth and all the things that are therein. The seas and all that is therein. And thou preservest them all. And all the host of heaven worship thee. There's this understanding by these men of God that God has created all the stars above, all the heavens of the heavens. But also they realise that which is even in the sea. a wonderful opening to a prayer and um, I'll go along with those thoughts God has created the eel and there's things happening about the eel that I'll probably never understand this side of the kingdom age so wondrous is it and it's just an eel most of us have no particular interest in such a thing and even when I saw one in my youth, as I said, I was just put off by its slimeness. Even David wouldn't pick one up, and it's a classy, and they look beautiful. Wondrous creature. Now, in September or October, usually after rain, when the moon's overcast, they get the call. And that's not my sentence. I've lifted that straight off the internet on someone commenting about the movement of eels. And I rather like that phrase, that they get the call. And then the next sentence or two went on and says, nobody knows what, how they get this call or what it is. But in September or October, whether the eel's female or, or man, whether it's been in five years, ten years, or dare I say in some forgotten pool for 40 years, after rain and the moon's overcast, it gets the call and it starts moving. It starts moving to the sea. And just as a young glass eel elver, there was a determination by that creature to go into fresh water and go upstream, upriver. So there's a de determination now to go the other way. And go out to find the estuary and go out the estuary and into the sea and beyond. And no one really knows what triggers this. Let's put it that way. Nobody knows what triggers this off. Some make reference to the moon, such as I've got in that sentence. Some make reference to the rain. And yet I've read other articles when we get an old, an old uh, character who's been fishing eels in Norfolk or whatever for all his life, and he's 70-odd, and he says, it has to be a full moon. And when I read that, I chuckled in the light of that comment I've got on the screen. Make your mind up. But there's no doubt they do move. And uh, they go across wet grass. They go over land. And how about this? Due to their rigid gill structure, silver eels, as they're called now, conceal water within their gills 
This means they can survive 12 hours or even up to 48 hours out of the water. So the gills have been so designed by God to do that at that point. This, this fish is changing again. It's changing. It's got to change again because it's lived in fresh water for all those years and now it's going to move into brackish water and then it's going to go into salt water. It's got to go and cope in salt water again. But en route, it's got to go over land. Possibly. In days gone by, and generations older than my own, people out in the country, in coastal areas, they'd see, they'd see eels going over ground. Did anyone see eels in, in the other? Don't know. And by that time, such as the change in the creature, the gut has dissolved. It hasn't got a stomach. It's not going to eat again. What, what causes that to be? How does that happen? It just lives off the stored energy of its fat alone. There's more to it than that. The eyes enlarge. The eye pigments change for optimal vision in dim, blue, clear ocean light. On the top, you've got the yellow eel. Underneath, you've got the silver eel. And it's the silver eels that are on the move now toward the sea. And if you look carefully at that photograph, you'll see what's being said. The eye gets bigger and it changes so the eye can see in the depths, and we'll see how deep in a moment, in the depths of seawater, of the ocean, as opposed to a shallow stream. It's got uh, a different coloration, as I've already been referred to, a different coloration for countershading. So it helps in terms of predators. Got to change colour as well. It does. It's all being designed to do that. It's been programmed to do that. This is not by a lucky throw of the dice and a lucky throw of the dice again and again and again and again and about mutation after mutation after mutation you know, over millions and millions of years. No. Don't fall for that one. The cycle's got to work round one and then every subsequent round. Otherwise, there's no cycle. And so it's programmed to do this and it changes. Again, some debate on this one. Um, at least six months. Some would say it's longer than that. But anyway, at least six months, that's the view at the moment. These eels, when they reach the sea, travel at 3,720 miles to the spawning grounds. And I hope you can remember where the spawning grounds were. That, that sea without a coastline? If they survived the heron, the otter, and another fisherman on the route, and if it had to go over land, and it wasn't longer than 48 hours, they'd end up in the Sargasso Sea. And that has been happening for centuries and centuries and centuries. That was happening for many a long year before 1922. And there's our little diagram. And um, they have recently discovered in the last couple of years something else which is astounding. The eels first head south towards the Azores. They then pick up the conveyor belt ocean current that propels them towards the Sargasso Sea. They go by the most efficient route rather than the shortest. Up to three years ago, everyone thought they went the shortest way. Surely they did. And the problem of the timing is because when these eels go on the move, and when they're reckoned to spawn in April, how can they possibly do 3,720 miles in those few months? How can they possibly do it? How fast are they swimming at? You know, if they swim at 15 miles an hour, they're not going to get there. But now they know. Rather than going shortest route, they go south. They go down off West Africa. And then having got down to West Africa, they're swept along by the current. Probably a lot faster than 15 miles an hour. 
Now, no one's going to tell me that that's come by chance. That some eels, by good fortune, managed to achieve this and then they reduced, reproduced others that somehow remembered or somehow it was in their genes and so they could do it again and again and again. It's always been the case. It's been designed thus. And so they go the most efficient route rather than the shortest. There's something else they found out in the last couple of years. They spend a lot of time and energy moving vertically in the water. During the day they might swim as deep as 1.2 kilometres, three quarters of a mile down, three quarters of a mile down, and then at night they come up, um, up to about 200 metres. And there's all sorts of discussions as to what's going on there. Uh, the behaviour is likely to be connected with navigation, the avoidance of predators. At least that's a, a common held view. But there are others that say, hang on a minute, it might be something to do with exposure to temperature, and the temperature changes somehow affects them in terms of their reproductive organs. Because eels don't become fully mature to reproduce until they get to the Sargasso Sea. So some think it's got something to do with that. And uh, there are a few people, because there's so many things in the world, there are so many things to be researching. There's so many wonderful things of God's creation. Uh, for those scientists, whether they believe in God or not, there's so many things for them to look at. I guess the eel comes down pretty low on the list. So there's still a lot they don't know, and there's only a few people that are looking. But they found out as they put transmitters in one or two eels, just had the technology to do this in recent times. Um, they've done it recently with cuckoos, which is another talk I've done, and uh, another fantastic thing to be following through, seeing the migration of cuckoos. We've learnt a lot about cuckoos in the last three or four years. Anyway, same idea. We've got the technology now to put transmitters and get these transmitters on eels, and they found they put these transmitters on these eels, and that's how they discovered they go south most efficient route, go down towards the Azores. The only problem was transmission stops, etc., etc., and they've discovered now that not only otters eat eels, not only herons eat eels, an occasional human being eats eels, pilot whales eat eels. <laughs> There's our cycle. Um... The eggs, whoa, 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 let's go up there back. The eggs, um, uh, I say presume because nobody's actually brought eggs to the surface yet. Uh, that makes me laugh. No one's actually done that yet. You now you get your flat head, event, you know, you get your flat head, then you get your glass eel, then you get your yellow eel, then you get your silver eel, and then finally, as it goes, those 3,000. 720 miles or thereabouts the mature eel and the cycle goes round again and it's taken years years and the only problem with that cycle is man actually breaking it up through pollution and uh, obstructions Richard Shelton um, is recognised as a, a biologist of, of some merit to do with fisheries and so on. And he, and he made this comment. <coughs> it is senseless to spawn in the sea where there are more predators and then feed in fresh water where there is less food. He can't get his head round it. I mean, the salmon get it right. The salmon do it the other way round. That's sensible. Still incredibly miraculous as far as I'm concerned. But the salmon get it the right way round. The eel does it this way. It's crazy to spawn in the sea where there are more predators and then feed in fresh water where there's less food. But we've got eels and there have been eels for many a long time. God knows what he's doing. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. <coughs> 
O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches.